Chasing Leviathan is a podcast about pursuing truth, one big question at a time through the discipline of listening. Truth is too big to tame. But if we pay close attention, we might get the chance to glimpse something truly magnificent. So please join me in this pursuit one week at a time. Hello and welcome to Chasing Leviathan. I'm your host, PJ Weary, and I'm here today with Dr. Nicholas B. Dirks, Professor Emeritus at UC Berkeley in Columbia, uh, known for his work in anthropology and history, the former chancellor of UC Berkeley, and the president and CEO of the New York Academy of Sciences. Uh, Dr. Dirks, wonderful to have you on today. Great to be with you, PJ. And we're talking about your book, uh, The City of Intellect, The Uses and Abuses of the University. Uh, tell us why this book, where did, I mean, I, there's a very clear personal component to it. Um, but what led you to this project? Yeah. So, you know, this is a different book than any of the ones I've written before, uh, by, uh, by a big distance. And, uh, I probably would have screamed if somebody told me 20 years ago, I was going to write something that uh, resembled a memoir. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I, I didn't mean for this book to, to be that, although it, it certainly has components of a memoir in it. But what, what I tried to do uh, really was to use certain elements of my own personal experience to hang a larger story about, um, about the predicament of, 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 uh, of the university in American life, uh, framing it historically. I am in part a historian, so that kind of goes with the territory. Uh, but then bringing it not only very much up to the present, but up to uh, up to present uh, debates and discussions about, you know, what is uh, uh, the future of university education? Uh, does the does the education that universities provide really prepare people for the world as we know it today? Uh, do some of the things that universities have traditionally believed in, like the liberal arts, still matter? Uh, does the cost of college uh, uh, effectively exclude its offerings to most people? And, um, uh, and, and, uh, and indeed, are there ways in which uh, we can justify or perhaps uh, turn around the, 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 the trajectory that has led to uh, the unaffordability of college for all but a few? Uh, what and how uh, do we uh, do we think about you know the the mission of the public university, which of course has a wonderful history in this country, which was part of an effort to bring education to the people, to make it much more uh, accessible to a public than uh, of course was the case when colleges and universities were first established in the U.S. in the 18th and 19th century, drawing, of course, on German universities and English universities and ultimately on European universities by background. Uh, so, you know, I have had the good fortune of teaching and working at, uh, at a number of really terrific institutions of higher education. I began my teaching career uh, actually in a one-year gig, but it turned out to uh, be a more regular one, and then ultimately a place where I got tenure at Caltech, very different kind of institution than the University of Chicago, where I'd done my PhD, or Wesleyan University, where I did my undergraduate work, uh, and um, had a wonderful experience there, but I wasn't by virtue of my own fields and the specialization of Caltech able to take graduate students and work with them. So I took an offer to go to the University of Michigan, where I, again, had a terrific uh, 10 years and, uh, and, and, and an opportunity to not only work with graduate students, but to build an altogether new graduate program that brought together the departments of history and anthropology and an interdepartmental PhD program that I set up with a few colleagues. Uh, and it was in the course of doing that, really thinking about you know, how to uh, create both more interdisciplinary kinds of PhD programs and opportunities for students, but also to, uh, to focus uh, increasingly on the kind of global components of education, which of course were connected to my own scholarly work in India, uh, that I fell into this kind of um, 
administrative vortex uh, and began to uh, get asked to do various things that I had actually never thought I would be asked to do. And uh, if asked to do, I never thought I would say, yes, I might go on and, and do them. And so it was actually on the basis of uh, the experience of building that interdepartmental PhD program at the University of Michigan, I was invited to Columbia to chair the anthropology department. That was pretty awesome because uh, first of all, I got my PhD in history, not in anthropology, although I studied a lot of anthropology. So it seemed like a, a, a kind of interesting opportunity to, uh, to really learn and embed myself in, a, in an adjacent but different discipline. Uh, but to do so at Columbia, which was the place where anthropology was founded uh, as, a, as, a, as a graduate program in the United States under the leadership of Franz Boas, an extraordinary figure uh, who himself was trained as a geophysicist in Germany, uh, but uh, as I said, created the first PhD program in anthropology in the US, went on to train some of the most extraordinary anthropologists of the 20th century from Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead and Zora Neale Hurston uh, to people like A.L. Krober and Melville Herskovitz and others who went on to set up some of the other great departments of anthropology in the U.S., Herskovitz at, at Northwestern, Krober at, at Berkeley, uh, and quite a number of others who played major roles in, uh, in the development of anthropology in the U.S. And so, you know, I went to New York, uh, 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 found myself able to hire a lot of people. I brought in people from around the world, some of them anthropologists, some of them not. The idea was, of course, to bring people in from the global south as well as from the Western Academy in order to shake up the field of anthropology and to uh, uh, really begin to take the kind of post-colonial critique that I participated in, uh, namely that anthropology itself had been born in part out of the colonial experience, but to take the critique of that uh, and rebuild an anthropology that was able to look at colonialism, not just critically, but from the point of view of the colonized as well as the colonizer. Uh, and to change the terms and to reframe the conversations that, uh, that go on in, uh, in the field. And Columbia afforded a great opportunity to do that. We uh, were able to recruit people from, uh, um, from the University of Cape Town, from Uganda, from the West Indies, from India, from other parts of the world, along with uh, and a few friends from the University of Michigan who I brought with me to uh, the Big Apple and, uh, and others too. Uh, and I had a great time. Columbia is a very different kind of university. It's uh, obviously not like Caltech, uh, an institute of science and technology, not like Michigan, a great Midwestern public university, uh, but a private university that's in the Ivy League, albeit an Ivy League uh, uh, college and university that's in New York City and somewhat distinct and different because of its uh, very, very urban kind of uh, uh, location. Uh, and also the fact that in relationship to the rest of the Ivy League was a place that actually brought in more students from public high schools and uh, was more diverse, uh, at least for many years, than some of its, uh, some of its uh, peer, uh, peers in the, in the Ivy League. But, you know, uh, I was chairing the anthropology department. I happened to have met Lee Bollinger, who had been president of the University of Michigan before I left and then came to Columbia as president. He asked me to be the dean of the faculty and uh, vice president of the arts and sciences at Columbia. And I thought, hey, uh, now I get an opportunity not just to go to an adjacent discipline and learn a little bit more about anthropology and work with anthropology as a field to build a different kind of critical space in the social sciences, but I can actually now work with colleagues across 29 departments. Uh, many interdisciplinary and interdepartmental program centers, institutes, and, uh, and the like, uh, and learn much more about uh, the university as an institution. And I was pleased to work with Lee Bollinger, a very brilliant First Amendment uh, constitutional scholar and, um, uh, and somebody I had a high uh, regard for and who had all kinds of plans to make Columbia more global and to do new things and so on. So I, uh, I, I, I took the job. Uh, and it changed, uh, it changed the course of my life in dramatic ways. I started having almost no control over my time as opposed to before as an academic when I had, you know, uh, a, a, a rich level of control over, over time because, of course, I needed it both for writing and research as well as for uh, teaching and administrative work in the department. 
But I, I did, um, in the course of this, uh, begin to learn all kinds of things about the university. I felt, in fact, that I was doing field work in university administration. It was uh, a kind of ethnographic experience, <laughs> albeit one uh, in which I was an insider. Uh, but, um, but it was always uh, as much about learning new things as it was about trying to, uh, you know, give a payback to, uh, to the university for the, for the good fortunes uh, uh, I had been able to uh, experience as a result of my education and my, my, my good luck to get uh, jobs in great places. And then, you know, uh, I began getting calls about being a university president. Uh, initially, I resisted them, although I was always intrigued. And then, at, uh, at some point, uh, I got asked to interview at the University of California, Berkeley, for the next uh, chancellor position. And uh, lo and behold, within a couple of weeks, I had an offer to move west. So I went to Berkeley, and I went as chancellor. And Berkeley is obviously, you know, a terrific university. It's uh, it's a shining example, like Michigan, but in some ways even more so of a public university that uh, not only was able to compete compete with the best private universities, but uh, did so with levels of excellence, uh, but also commitments to access to a much broader public that uh, really makes it a kind of, uh, uh, a kind of beacon for, uh, for what public higher education in this country has, has, has stood for. Uh, and um, that was even more interesting. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and of course, it's not only the beacon of, uh, of public higher education, it's also a place that is known for its activism. Uh, and uh, the years, uh, you know, beginning when I got the call to Berkeley in 2012 and 2017, when I decided to step down, uh, were years of, uh, again, extraordinary uh, change in American life, uh, uh, change in the university world. Uh, it was a time when uh, the, the country was still uh, recovering from, uh, adjusting to a different kind of world after the Great Recession, uh, but of course also uh, went through one convulsion after the next, uh, uh, some of which were related to the rise of social media, some of which had to do with the um, uh, with with the uh, increasing uh, concern about uh, issues having to do with sexual harassment on campus, uh, other issues having to do with intercollegiate athletics, ultimately uh, uh, issues having to do with Black Lives Matter, uh, and finally with the election of Trump uh, as president in 2016 and some of the things that happened as a result of that. So I feel like even though I was there for a relatively short period of time, it was it was a time of uh, of, of, of big dislocation in the country uh, that was condensed into uh, uh, and um, expressed through, you know, one really interesting but often intractable situation I confronted at Berkeley after the next. Uh, and so when I stepped down and I was able to catch my breath uh, and I was thinking about doing what, uh, you know, what, what former administrators do, which is to go back to the faculty. Uh, I thought, well, you know, I've been away from the archive. I've been away from the field. I haven't, I've been back to India, but I haven't done research. Uh, what am I going to write next? Uh, and I thought, you know, I should write something about this, about the experience I had. Uh, and I should uh, uh, try to figure out uh, in a kind of broader way than one is able to when you're actually in the firing line day in and day out. Uh, what I might recommend, uh, what kinds of thoughts I, I have more broadly about how to deal with some of these kinds of crises, how to respond, how to uh, uh, actually perhaps um, uh, change some of the institutional structures that we take for granted, but, is, but are now getting pretty rusty, pretty old, and seem in, 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 uh, in need of uh, certainly uh, rethinking, reimagining, but also, I think, uh, in many cases, redoing. So... Uh, Little, little, uh, little by little, and then aided by the pandemic and the time that afforded, I uh, I wrote this book. Uh, one, thank you. So, if I just want to make sure that I'm tracking with you, uh, it has this ethnographic uh, study of the academy kind of feel, but perhaps has m more prescriptions as well. It's a little more prescriptive than just a pure ethnographic study. Is that a fair way to characterize it? Yeah, no, right. I mean, one of my uh, blurb writers actually said part memoir, part manifesto. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think you know, that may be putting it too boldly because it's uh, it's not a memoir in the classic sense, uh, nor is it a manifesto as I understand that. But 
but yeah, it's uh, it, it 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 begins with experiences of being, you know, a student, uh, a, a, a professor, uh, a chair, a dean, a chancellor, uh, and then it moves into uh, a kind of encapsulated history of of of, of the university in the U.S., uh, which is uh, basically to kind of set the stage for a set of reflections and recommendations around issues related to the crisis in the humanities, the contests over controversial speakers on campus, uh, debates about free speech and academic freedom, uh, questions having to do with the cost of college, with the uh, uh, basic resistance to change uh, on the part of most constituencies in universities, uh, whether faculty or alumni or donors or others, uh, uh, but in the context of, you know, the crisis of, of affordability and then ultimately the kind of crisis of political polarization that is roiled uh, every, uh, every major college campus uh, across the country. And of course, that was then. Uh, we've only seen in recent years since I finally sent off the last uh, galley proof to, uh, to Cambridge uh, University Press. Uh, a further escalation of uh, some of the issues that I that I that I write about and uh, uh, and document in my book. Uh, so you have that sub uh, that sub tagline, the uses and abuses of the university, uh, and you've referenced you know your personal experiences. One way that uh, I often find helps me understand these sorts of things. Um, what did the university provide for you? you? You mentioned, I think it's in the preface about, you may sound defensive at times, but you're trying to protect what was given to you. Um, so what did the university provide for you and what are you trying to protect here as you critique? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question and, um, and it's a central question to the book because uh, you know, education can mean a lot of different things. Obviously, it means a lot of th different things to different people. But uh, you know, in the context of some of the critiques of, uh, of the cost of, of higher education, there's been a growing call for you know not just relevance, but for um, uh, thinking about uh, education as predominantly equipping people with the skills they need to go on to vocations, to go on to jobs, to go on to careers, and to, um, uh, to have a, a viable future uh, that is often thought about in terms of um, income and, uh, uh, and, uh, and success uh, in you know, sort of classic uh, terms. Uh, but of course, this is at, at, at some odds to some of the ways in which uh, educators like me talk about the university, which is in terms of uh, uh, having an opportunity to grapple with the big issues, to think about, you know, what Aristotle uh, wrote about as the good life, to, uh, to think about um, uh, not just the self, but also our embeddedness in and relationship to the larger world, what kinds of obligations we have to be uh, citizens, to be, uh, to be uh, you know, uh, uh, in, a, in a whole variety of social contexts and relationships. Uh, which are uh, much more uh, than simply about self-realization, which one might begin with in some kind of uh, litany of, of what is part of an educational justification or, 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 or a set of you know, reasons that are behind a liberal arts education. But more broadly, what is it to be a member of society? What and how does one think about meaning that is both personal but also social and oriented around the public? So... I, uh, uh, I myself begin, as you just said in the preface, by talking a little bit about how transformational it was for me to go to college from a public high school, but to go to college and see these very, very smart people in, uh, in classes uh, disagree with each other about fundamental issues. And the example I give is, of course, I took my freshman year at college and it was, of course, about free will and determinism. And it was taught by a behavioral psychologist and a philosopher of religion. And the two of them uh, were, you know, incredibly smart and couldn't agree about a thing. And for me, this was, this was actually uh, the most, you know, extraordinary uh, thing because I always 
And these were, you know, those were those were heady political days, just like the present ones, where there didn't seem to be a lot of room in the middle uh, in most arguments. Uh, but there I saw these two people uh, who could have an amiable uh, but impassioned conversation with each other uh, in which they disagreed about first principles, but agreed about uh, the importance of having that conversation and having that conversation in the kind of rigorous way that one could in a college setting. That was for me, uh, uh, in a way, a, a, a kind of crystallization of what, of what a liberal arts education is all about. Uh, and so I, I, I build on that and, um, and, and, and seek to uh, find ways to not only uh, explain why that was so important for me, but to find ways perhaps to think about how one might be able to, uh, to protect at the level of um, institutional uh, uh, issues, protect that uh, uh, that component of education, even when it's uh, under attack, and even when it deserves to be criticized because it has seemed to be both irrelevant and too expensive a luxury by any estimation uh, uh, at the same time. So, uh, so the book is, 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 is an effort to kind of reframe this discussion about the liberal arts uh, and to do so in the context of accepting that there are real issues, real problems, uh, real concerns that need to be worked through within the university in order to uh, address them properly uh, and not just brush them aside and not just say, no, the university doesn't need to change. Yeah, I would love to come back to uh, what you see as those issues of the liberal arts, but also what you're trying to defend there. Um, but I think uh, it may be a good way to set that up and a kind of a central question that I think is uh, helpful when you call the university the city of intellect, where does that title come from? Where does that concept come from? And what does it mean? So it comes actually to direct quote from Clark Kerr, uh, who was president of the University of California between 1958 and 1967. And before that, he was the first chancellor of the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, so he, he was the first, I was the 10th, you know, I was in the line of succession. The reason he was the first, and he was the first as of 1952, and Berkeley goes back to 1868 when it was first established, uh, was because the president of the university uh, uh, at large used to be the equivalent of the chancellor at Berkeley uh, uh, before there were lots of different campuses, and even when there was uh, just a second one down in LA, UCLA. But Kerr was uh, an extraordinary leader, and as the president of the university system, he basically developed what was called the master plan. Uh, he developed it working with Governor Pat Gra Brown in 1960. And, uh, and what it did was to uh, uh, really create a kind of charter for public higher education in California in which uh, you had community colleges, you had the California State University system, and then you had a growing number of University of California campuses. And it established a, a set of uh, uh, kind of differentiation among the different levels of the university so that advanced research and PhD training would be done at the University of California. But uh, it was meant to be also a system that actually made social mobility a reality so that students from community colleges could, after a couple of years, either transfer into a Cal State University or into a uh, campus of the University of California. Uh, and, um, uh, and so the idea was not simply to separate these different tiers, but actually connect them uh, for students in, in, in ways that really would matter. And indeed, a third of the uh, students in the University of California are still transfer students from community colleges. So you could say the master plan is, is still working. But of course, the master plan also went along with a great deal of state support. Those were days when tuition payments were basically a set of fees that uh, that that cost a student uh, somewhere around seventy bucks a year. So uh, hard to imagine. Uh, yeah, <laughs> hard hard to imagine. Uh, wonderful to 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 think about bringing back, but um, unlikely. Uh, but Kerr uh, was able to do that both because of a kind of vision of a broader system uh, uh, around what public uh, uh, university. Um, education would be, and also because he forged very, very good working relationships with political figures in California, chief among which, of course, as I said, was Pat Brown. So I, 
I, I think the, uh, uh, the 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 story there is is a wonderful one, but but Brown, I'm sorry, uh, Kerr was an interesting guy for many different reasons, not least because he worried that uh, big campuses like Berkeley were losing some of the elements that he looked back in his own life uh, uh, as being as, as having been critical for his own education. He was an undergraduate at Swarthmore College before he went to Berkeley to uh, to do his his, his graduate work, and uh, and 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 he didn't want to lose that kind of small college um, uh, liberal arts education, uh, even in the in, in in the midst of trying to bring about this great vision for uh, public higher education, and so he 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 talked about what he thought of as the model for uh, for even a place like Berkeley. Uh, uh, as being something that he termed the city of intellect. But then he said in a, uh, in, in a, in a book he didn't write, but he, uh, uh, he did the last edition of it in, uh, in 2001, just two years before he died in 2003, that the city of intellect was a product of the 20th century in America. But the 20th century was no more. And the question really was whether there would be some way in which the city of intellect might survive uh, after, the, uh, after, the, after the transition from the 20th to the 21st century. And I took that as, uh, as a kind of um, way of thinking about you know, what Kerr and I both take to be some core ingredient to, uh, to education and then uh, uh, effectively you know, wonder in the book about whether or not it can survive, whether it will survive, under what conditions might it uh, uh, be able to be reborn, or is it gone forever? Uh, and um, and the subtitle of the book uh, is actually taken from uh, from from the book in which Kerr coined this term, "city of intellect." Uh, but his book was called "The Uses of the University." I add abuses partly in reference to Nietzsche, who wrote about the uses and abuses of history. Uh, but partly because uh, I wanted to, uh, to to tell a slightly different story in which I was uh, willing to confront, you know, some of the kinds of things that really I was deeply worried about in terms of uh, the issues that we've just talked about, namely, uh, you know, cost, affordability, accessibility, uh, uh, focus on the mission, uh, and um, and survivability into the future. Um, so forgive me when when you use. Uh, when you use city of intellect, uh, it, like as a model or a metaphor, is it is it the communal side of it you're focusing on, the structural side? How does the idea of a city uh, function when you're viewing the, the university? Yeah, so uh, again, a very good question uh, and one that I, uh, I, I come at in the book somewhat elliptically, so you're, you're, you're right to ask that. Um, I think I think of the of the image of the city of intellect uh, as being intentionally utopian. Uh, so yeah, it's this it's this kind of um, uh, vision one one has, and I, I actually use a, a, a depiction of an interesting image on the cover of the book that comes from a French edition of Gulliver's Travels, and one of the places Gulliver goes in his. Swiftian uh, voyage is to a place somewhere uh, in the South Pacific uh, that really uh, uh, has an, a floating a city on an island, uh, 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 which uh, he goes on to for a short period of time, writes about, and then and then and then leaves and waves goodbye to, and that's the image on the cover. But but I but I have in mind here the fact that uh, the, the 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 fundamental priorities of the university of a university education, but also of uh, research in the university, have to do with, uh, with, with a set of intellectual goals. Uh, and to, uh, uh, to actually achieve those goals, one has to have a set of commitments to, uh, to open debate, to open inquiry, uh, to the contest of ideas, to uh, uh, to to a uh, uh, to a, a kind of uh, framework or or a context in which in in which students, faculty, and others can come together, have very different views, uh, and seek to, if not resolve, certainly pursue their differences 
but via intellectual means. Uh, but it's it's got to be done in a in a in a larger context because the world is like that. So I use the image then of the city, uh, not just of you know some kind of um, abstracted uh, intellectual utopia, uh, to suggest that this is a place where lots of different people are, with lots of different uh, perspectives, lots of different uh, uh, subject positions, uh, lots of different roles, and as a result, a lot of different views, uh, but that nevertheless uh, could function as cities do. Here I'm talking to you, I'm in New York City. Uh, it has issues and it has uh, uh, lots of things that aren't working uh, particularly well, but it does work as a city. And, um, and it's, that, it's that idea. Uh, so what I'm really seeking to do in some ways is to is to ground the idea of the utopia of, uh, of, of of the kind of idea that intellectual values are preeminent with the reality that those uh, those those ideas have to be uh, worked through negotiated um, and um, uh, and argued about uh, in, in, a, in a real social context where there are lots of differences and lots of, uh, 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 lots of ways of, of conceiving of what and how those ideas should, uh, should signify. Uh, so that's, that's the way I, I interpret this image. Uh, and it uh, explains in part why it is that I go on to uh, suggest a number of things in the book. On the one hand, for example, that, uh, you know, we, we, we have to go back to, uh, to thinking about the original meaning of academic freedom. Uh, we, ha we have to accept that in university life, people are going to be offended. Uh, it has ever been thus. It's not just today that there are issues of offense. When a colleague of mine at the University of Michigan used to teach a course on the history of Christianity, he would offend people in the uh, class who might be fundamentalist Christians simply by virtue of, uh, of, 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 of telling different uh, 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 histories of, of, of the church and different ways of conceiving of the Bible or of the, uh, of the priesthood or of the uh, relationship of Christianity to other, uh, other both sects but also religions. And, um, uh, and, and so, you know, uh, that goes with the territory. But... Uh, but it has, to be, it has to be, I think, rethought in a context in which we become so concerned about offense, uh, which is not to say that I think that one goes around defending people, but rather uh, in the university context, but rather that one has to build in a whole set of um, uh, uh, expectations about what it means to, uh, to come and have arguments from different kinds of positions and from, uh, diff with different points of view. So I, talk, I write a lot about uh, uh, issues of, of academic freedom, and I, and I write about them in the context of things that happened very specifically in the short period of time I was at Berkeley. In 1964, Berkeley was the scene of the free speech movement. Uh, it was famously a, a struggle that um, was meant to contest the policy of the University of California, which was uh, uh, to keep the university as a politically neutral space. Uh, and the, uh, the students who were uh, motivated to, uh, uh, to, to agitate for, uh, for free speech on campus uh, were students who were basically back from Freedom Summer. They'd been uh, engaged in the civil rights movement in struggle in Mississippi in the summer of 1964. And they wanted to recruit other students to participate in the civil rights movement on campus. And they were told they could not uh, in fact, solicit for participation in a political, uh, for a political cause uh, on the campus itself. They had to move off campus, and they thought that that was inappropriate, and they won. Uh, and, uh, and so after 64, the university said, okay, uh, we'll have uh, a completely open uh, uh, kind of political uh, theater uh, in, not in the classroom, but in, in certain public spaces where, uh, where, where anybody can come and speak about any particular political point of view and so on. And it was, it was a very strong value, a very strong commitment, uh, and something that uh, uh, the regents of the university were initially somewhat skeptical about, but finally accepted along with the students and, of course, the faculty as well. So 50 years later, we were celebrating, I was now chancellor, uh, we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement. And, 
And I, I, every fall, I had to also uh, uh, make a statement about the importance of civility on campus, the need for people to, and this was just kind of a routine uh, uh, thing the chancellor would do. Every fall, you know, remember we have community principles. Uh, these community principles include, uh, you know, a certain kind of commitment to civil uh, dialogue uh, uh, across, uh, uh, you know, across different groups and, 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 uh, and, and positions. And, um, and interestingly enough, I got some blowback by people who said, look, you know, actually, this is the time we're celebrating free speech. Uh, you shouldn't say anything that would in any way compromise or abrogate our commitment to total free speech, which will include, you know, screaming about something you feel passionately about. Uh, and, um, uh, and the fact that I had, you know, mentioned free speech and the free speech movement at the same time that I mentioned civility was, uh, was, was an opening for people to register their continued belief that uh, the chancellor had to be, you know, completely outspoken on this issue of free speech and, and, and not, you know, have anything else obscuring its, its priority. All right. Three years later. <laughs> the uh, 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 young Republicans at uh, Berkeley have invited Milo Yiannopoulos. I don't know if you remember Milo Yiannopoulos, but he was at that point uh, a darling of the extreme right. He was uh, writing for Breitbart, uh, and, uh, and he was going around from campus to campus in something that he called the Dangerous Faggot Tour. Uh, uh, he himself uh, uh, identified as gay, but he was... Uh, he, he loved to go to campuses and insult uh, feminism, uh, anybody who was trans, uh, and what he considered to be what was then called politically correct that we now call woke, uh, you know, sensibilities on the part of, uh, of, of students who he would go and speak with. Uh, so, um, in fact, he was going around from campus to campus. There were some violent incidents that happened at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, at the University of California, Davis, at the University of Washington in Seattle. And students and faculty came to me and said, you can't have Milo Yiannopoulos come to, to Berkeley. Uh, it, would, uh, it would cause harm. Uh, and they were saying two things when they said that. They were saying, on the one hand, it would cause harm because of what he says. And if he comes and uh, critiques, for example, uh, uh, anyone who is trans, this is, uh, this is a violation of our, of our speech codes. Uh, but they also were, of course, worried that it would be physical harm as well because of the experience of, 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 of some of these other universities. And they had you know, valid points to make. But, uh, but in my discussions with them, I realized that um, something had changed in the intervening three years. And whereas, you know, three years before any conditionality that might be attached to free speech was, uh, uh, you know, was seen as bad now, these conditions were actually becoming more important than free speech. And there were increasing numbers of students and faculty who uh, actually held that, you know, there was no such thing as free speech on campus, because once you look at uh, the relationships of power that are embedded within any kind of speech act, you immediately uh, uh, see that, you know, some people are free to speak and other people are not. Uh, so uh, the only way actually to interpret free speech is to uh, fully license the speech of the powerless and the oppressed, but to control the speech of those who have more power and who are, uh, uh, or who we might see as oppressors rather than uh, those who are oppressed. And in this case, Milo was an oppressor. Uh, and, uh, and, and he would, um, by definition, be using free speech in a way that uh, we talk about now as having been weaponized uh, by a right-wing political agenda. Uh, but, you know, I said, look, you know, uh, this is the place where free speech uh, was born on American college campuses. This is, uh, you know, fundamental to our identity. Uh, and, and besides, um, you know, the, the jurisprudence on this is clear that uh, you know, when you are committed to free, free speech, you don't make judgments about who's going to speak and who isn't. You may not like what they're going to say. You can even condemn what they're going to say. And I did condemn what I knew him to have said in other contexts before. But I still said, we have to uh, uh, invite him to campus. Well, he came to campus. Uh, there was a major riot. 
he wasn't allowed to speak in the end because uh, we had to usher him off campus. It was uh, it was quite dangerous. So uh, there were there were people who were breaking into the student center, causing uh, 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 tens of thousands of dollars worth of damage on our campus, and then they went around and caused uh, uh, even more damage in the city of Berkeley, right next door, uh, and um, uh, and it was a mess. Uh, uh, now, the images of that event were broadcast on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News around the world. Uh, a lot of people saw them. I got calls from parents asking if, uh, you know, it's safe for their kids to stay on campus because there was a fire in the plaza that looked like a major uh, conflagration, but was, it was just a small fire. But it was nevertheless an image that got broadcast everywhere. But, you know, um, you know who was watching Fox News back in 2017, uh, usually in an ante room off the Oval Office in the White House. So the next morning I wake up and uh, there's a tweet from the president of the United States, Donald Trump, uh, basically condemning Berkeley for having uh, shut down this uh, exercise in free speech uh, and asked whether we should receive no more federal funding. Right. So it was a uh, it became a, ma a major, you know, national incident. It was the first uh, tweet against the university president. I feel proud to have been the one who got, uh, who, who fielded it, but um, but it, of course, uh, it was it was non-trivial, uh, as we now know. It wasn't just, uh, as it were, a figure of speech, uh, but it, as an event, uh, uh, I think was uh, was curious because uh, it was an illustration of how views on campus had changed about, uh, about free speech. And um, of course, there were lots of other incidents around controversial speakers that had different kinds of outcomes in each case, but which, of course, occasioned a great deal of public commentary and often con 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 condemnation of the university. Uh, and condemnation because we, uh, you know, there we were, we would allow anybody on the left to speak. We would not allow anybody with, uh, with views on the right uh, to speak. And of course, in the context of that, I had to uh, I had to defend what we had done, uh, and I th I've thought about it a lot uh, since. And it's, you know, it's part of the reason that I uh, I, I decided to to write the book to say, look, uh, uh, it was it was easy for us to to advocate for free speech when it was you know speech that we liked, but the whole point about free speech is that um, you have to be able to advocate for it when you don't like it. Uh, and yes, power does play a role uh, in uh, doing uh, what you say, namely even going to the point of weaponizing free speech as a principle. And we've seen that with Citizens United and other kinds of, uh, 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 you know, other kinds of interpretations of the First Amendment that go well beyond uh, 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 what we traditionally conceived of as speech. But the university itself is a place where uh, ultimately our mission uh, uh, depends upon our capacity to, 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 to hear and consider a speech of, time, of kinds that, uh, uh, that, that we find uh, uh, disagreeable uh, and, uh, and potentially even offensive. And so that became, in a way, the, uh, the kind of storyline that was the pretext for reconceiving the need to defend free speech at a, at, a, at a different kind of moment in American history. And I, I'll just say one more thing, and forgive me for going on. No, but, no worries. Uh, uh, but, 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 but I wanted to make this defense from, on the, from, from not as part of a general attack on wokeism, because I think you know, uh, much of what has been said about uh, uh, wokeism, whether it's your governor in the state of Florida or uh, any number of other people writing about the university, uh, has caricatured. Uh, what goes on on university campuses to a, to a grievous extent. Uh, you know, a lot of what people refer to as wokeism is simply being respectful of other people on campus for who they are, uh, for their histories, for their identities, uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and respect. Uh, and indeed, dare I use the term civility, are good things. And in fact, they're often critical for uh, our capacity to do things like get together on a university campus and talk about difficult issues and try to work through things uh, in, uh, in intellectual debate. But, um, uh, uh, but by the same token, I wanted to uh, suggest that there were issues on university campuses that did require a rethinking uh, about our commitments 
uh, to open inquiry and uh, and and genuinely uh, 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 open exchanges about about things that uh, people have severe disagreements about. And now, of course, we're seeing this in the case of the Middle East in ways that I think uh, uh, have kind of um, uh, brought the chickens home to roost and made it very, very difficult because university presidents are being asked now to make statements really that are political statements uh, uh, and not simply statements where they are concerned about the safety of students, concerned about the expression of uh, prejudice uh, that is, uh, or often hatred directed at particular communities. Uh, uh, but you know they're 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 actually being asked to adjudicate you know political issues and uh, in ways that I think uh, not only go beyond the remit of what universities should do, but um, uh, but really put them in impossible situations. And in that sense, I think you know uh, uh, we've 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 come to this point for all kinds of historical reasons that now require us again to rethink all of these fundamental issues. How can we, you know, be respectful uh, of a diverse community on campus at the same time that we're genuinely open for debate? And that is part of what I write about in the book. Absolutely. Uh, I've been blessed to be able to carry out this podcast and talk to um, many people from uh, academia through this podcast. And... Uh, I've always been struck by the um, genuine concern, the serious thought and argumentation they put into their work. Uh, and I think as you talk about the characterization of um, wokeism, uh, I am struck by the, the incredible difference between my conversations on here and when I go on social media. And... Part of the reason that the caricatures happen is because of the enormous explosion of self-expression. Would whatever you want to find, you can find a real example of. So the caricatures yeah. have become real, but they're not to be. They should not be taken seriously. And that's what I generally find is when I'm on social media, I see something that angers me, or that's like that's really foolish. And when I when I take a step back, I'm like. <laughs> this person is really of no importance, right? Like, 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 why are we, what, and like, what the reason that we, that this is being brought up is to justify a straw man. And because, I mean, <laughs> I have my own memories of being a freshman and the, the, the things that I would say and the things that, you know, <laughs> before you really dig in. And so, um, I think yeah, that's part of why I, I want to do this podcast is, you know, hopefully help with that but also uh it is it's been fascinating to see and i wonder how much of that is that i mean that's an incredible turnaround that you have people fighting for unconditional freedom of speech and then three years later they're trying to attach major conditions to it right like that's not that's rather quick in the the grand scheme uh of academic freedom um just walking through that uh I, what, one thing I wanted to ask you about, because this is something you mentioned at the beginning, I think is part of what makes academic, um, it's part of its strengths and weaknesses, is you talked about the, you use this image of the guild from Clark Kerr, um, uh, Clark mm -hmm. Kerr and you talk about um, irony and critical distance. Uh, can you talk about, and I think this goes to one of the things you, you've mentioned is the insularity. So this is one of the, the things that I'm sure you have prescriptions on. What are the uses and abuses of irony and critical distance in academia? Because that seems to be one of its major strengths, right? Yeah, well, you know, irony, I, I guess, is always a dangerous trope, right? Because <laughs> uh, you know, one person's irony is another person's satire, and, and then, you know, you keep sliding down from there. Um, I think the... Uh, you know, the, it was certainly the case. I mean, you're right that, 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 uh, Clark Kerr reflected a certain kind of, uh, uh, capacity for irony that, uh, you know, that, that actually got him in trouble every now and then, you know, one of the things that I, I mean, when I write about him, I, uh, I talk about his, his nostalgia in some ways for the city of intellect and his commitment to trying to provide undergraduate educational experiences that 
albeit in the context of a big, large, uh, research-intensive public university, uh, aren't quite the same as the you know times he had at uh, at, at Sleepy Swarthmore. Um, uh, that you know they that he you know he 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 certainly you know understands that you know that things change in in the larger context. He had certain kinds of commitments and so on, but at the same time. Uh, he he wrote about um, uh, he wrote about the university as a multiversity. Uh, he wrote about the knowledge industries. I mean, he was an economist. He was actually a labor economist, so he understood that uh, the industrial production of knowledge, in some sense, was an image that uh, needed to be taken on board in the way it, in the way in which uh, uh, research was done in uh, in the late uh, half, the second half of the twentieth century in U.S. universities, and he. You know, he he uh, he 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 turned figures of speech that were meant to be both provocative and sometimes ironic, only to find himself getting into trouble. And um, he was attacked by Mario Savio, who is the leader of the free speech movement, among other things, for this idea of the the knowledge industries. And um, and and Mario famously he gave a speech about throwing your sometimes you know things get to the point where you have to throw your body on the machine to stop the wheels of industrial production because they're so. Uh, destructive to the human uh, spirit and ultimately the human body, and uh, uh, and Kerr, you know, sort of shook his head, and, uh, head and uh, I'm sure, and, and certainly wrote that he regretted, uh, you know, giving making it so easy for 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 somebody like Savia to go after him uh, on the grounds of uh, what was uh, was meant to be ironic and was taken to be uh, literal. But uh, but again, uh, you know, the 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 debate that went on was was an interesting one because it was contestatory at certain moments, but it was also uh, uh, it, 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 it also had a resolution. And uh, on December eighth, nineteen sixty four, when the faculty voted to side with the students uh, to uh, accept the uh, new idea about how free speech should be protected on campus, and uh, and 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 the regents and Kerr went along with uh, with the faculty. Savio then got up to say, "Okay, now we have one." Uh, he quoted Diogenes, and he quoted to the in, in, in effect to, uh, to 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 suggest that now we have the responsibility of free speech, which we have to zealously uh, uh, protect and uh, and guard. And um, I'm moving away from irony now, but to uh, the point where, in fact, you know, whatever kinds of uh, uh, contests had taken place, there was alignment at the end of this uh, around this uh, this sense of the responsibility that came with winning a particular political battle, uh, and um, and 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 that you know that at least uh, you know gave an opening, I think, to uh, to show that. Uh, uh, it was a, it was it was a really really I mean it was it, it was it, it was it was not a, a peaceful movement I mean it involved uh, occupations of buildings forcible uh, evacuation of people by the police uh, you know lots of classes and other uh, normal events uh, being shut down and uh, very angry things being said between students and faculty and administration and so on but uh, but it did lead to that kind of understanding at the end and that to me is uh, is a kind of model. Uh, for you know, again, I was uh, you know I was I was uh, involved in some of the protests against the war in Vietnam when I was a college student. So uh, I'm not by any means suggesting that uh, you know that speech alone is the way in which you conduct political protest. There are uh, legitimate reasons to to engage in protest and uh, uh, peaceful protest. And uh, uh, and there are times when uh, you know when when words become you know fighting words in a way, but. There was also, I think, a kind of shared sense of values, uh, which, uh, which, which I, which I fear now we're, you know, we're looking at only in the rearview mirror, and uh, and therefore having to to rethink how we, how we can create a world in which uh, there there will be shared values again that will allow these kinds of, uh, these kinds of um, uh, uh, arguments, these kinds of debates. And even these kinds of ironic, uh, uh, you know, way, figures of speech as being part of those debates to 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 be you know to be brought back into the ambit of uh, of what is possible. 
Uh, and uh, as you said, PJ, and you, you talk to academics all the time. You know that academics just were always engaged in argument. Uh, you know, the, uh, as a historian, uh, you know, we're all revisionist historians. Every one of us, uh, you know, when we take up a topic to work on, think about the historians who've done things that have inspired us, but we also are thinking about the arguments that we want to basically argue against. Uh, and, and, and if possible, we want to actually refute them. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and there can be, you know, uh, disagreements that are, you know, very polite and there can be disagreements that end up with, uh, you know, the equivalent of, uh, academic shouting matches, uh, between and among faculty who share much more than they differ in around, you know, everything from how you use evidence, how do you make an argument, how do you conceive of a historical project, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of cacophony and there should be. That's what, you know, that's what it's uh, really all about. And, uh, and yet, uh, there have to be certain ways in which that broader uh, cacophony is at least contained to the point where uh, it is productive of new understandings, new ways of seeing the world, new knowledge, uh, and, um, uh, and, 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 and new ways in which that knowledge uh, can inform the lives of, uh, of, of younger people who come up through the university uh, that is still relevant to the world they're entering, however different that world may be today than it was, you know, 20 years ago or 40 years ago when I was starting out. Um, I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, one, thank you. That was a, a very helpful answer. Um, I mean, they've all been fascinating and I've, I've really enjoyed this. Uh, I wondered, um, I, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't get you to at least speak a little bit about the crisis in humanities what you see as the the root problem and what you see um, as, uh, what is your prescription to solve that root problem? So, yeah, I don't have a single prescription. It's not just an RX that I can <laughs> scribble out and uh, affix a, a, an un, unreadable signature. Uh, to, I was but, hoping for that silver um, bullet. Okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, no, no, yeah. And so it's still in testing. The, uh, the FDA hasn't approved it yet, but... Um, no, I, you know, what I talk a little bit about the history of the humanities, and I, I suggest in the book that, uh, and I use the work of some other, other people who have written, you know, very helpfully about this. Uh, I suggest that in a way the humanities in the 20th century became installed in the curriculum to replace what had been, uh, in the first instance, a much more uh, religiously based kind of curriculum. Uh, but even in, uh, and after, you know, some of the secularization of the uh, of the late 19th and early 20th centuries had become very much a kind of civic educational uh, kind of program. So, you know, you get at Columbia where I taught uh, in 1919, right after World War I, you get a course that is called uh, uh, something about uh, stu the study of war. Uh, and, and in 1920, it, it, it gets renamed as a, as a study in, in world peace. Uh, you know, to go along, I guess, with, um, uh, with Woodrow Wilson's uh, speeches to that effect. But, uh, but it became the core curriculum, uh, ultimately, and it became courses like Contemporary Civilization, Great Books, uh, Literature, Humanities, and so on. Uh, in many other universities where such a core was not created, or at least was not continued, uh, uh, there were distribution requirements for courses in the humanities that basically played that same role. They were to uh, provide some uh, place in the curriculum where issues around values, where issues around uh, 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 the nature of morality and ethics, uh, and, um, and, 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 and models of what perhaps appropriate values uh, might be taken from great works of literature, great moments in history, great leaders in history, usually from the West, uh, would, be, would be used in some sense to provide a more secular version of a kind of religious moral education. Um, but, you know, the way it plays out uh, in the middle of the 20th century is that the humanities become basically a set of departments uh, in national literatures. So you have English, sometimes you have English in comparative literature, but you have departments of French and German and Spanish and Portuguese and so on and so forth. Uh, and then you have a smattering of other, uh, of other disciplines. You know, you have, of course, you know, you have philosophy. But philosophy came out of, you know, Western classics and then, you know, changed in different kinds of ways. You have sometimes religious studies 
and you know, a few other uh, departments that sometimes, sometimes get placed in, uh, uh, in humanities. History is one of those fields that is sometimes a social science, sometimes a humanities, but it's fundamentally humanistic even when it uses quantitative methods to do archival anal uh, uh, the analysis of data from archives. Uh, anthropology, again, a social science, even if it has humanistic uh, aspects and so on. But for the most part, what the humanities consists in uh, are what we thought to be um, this, this array of disciplines that introduced us to questions of meaning and value uh, in the middle of the 20th century. So what I, what I argue is that Let's not think about the specific elements that are taken to be the humanities. Let's talk about more, uh, more abstract question. How do, we, how do we think about humanistic learning uh, in a broader sense? And what, if we were going to be creating a new kind of uh, uh, institutional structure for the university today and a new kind of curriculum to go along with that, uh, how would we do that? I mean, what would we place in the, the, the same uh, uh, container as, as, as the things that were placed there 50, 60, 70, 80 years ago. Uh, and maybe it would look quite different. Uh, and maybe that's what we should start thinking about when we talk about the crisis of humanity. So the crisis of humanity shouldn't simply be seen as, you know, uh, my PhD students in history can't get jobs. I don't like that. I, uh, I'm against it, but, uh, uh, but, but I... Uh, but it's a reality. So, uh, you know, are there different ways in which we could conceive of the humanities uh, in order to give them uh, a more secure place in our curriculum? So I think uh, uh, on the one hand, I'm, I'm surely I'm, I'm, I'm certainly concerned about uh, the, the, the crisis in the humanities, but I also think that it's a crisis of our own making uh, in part and that we therefore have to do our part. Uh, to reconceive uh, 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 how they might be structured in a university, how they might be structured in a, in a curriculum. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and at the same time, I say once we do that, uh, I think it's important to, uh, to say over and over again that there's not a single issue in the world today, whether it's in the world of technology or science or what have you, that isn't uh, 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 almost immediately also an issue that refers back to a set of humanistic questions. Uh, we're dealing with this in artificial intelligence right now, uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, I don't have to explain to anyone listening to this that uh, it would be a good thing for people with uh, humanistic and, and social scientific understandings of some of the key issues around what and how machines and humans interact uh, uh, to play a role uh, in designing how the next, you know, uh, versions of, uh, of machine intelligence will indeed interact with, uh, uh, with us as a, as a species. When I hear, as I did actually last night, Sam Altman on a, uh, on a podcast say, you know, we're thinking very carefully about how we're going to design the next uh, uh, iteration of machine-human uh, interaction, I'm thinking, well, I'm not too sure I like that. I mean, I actually don't want uh, uh, this really important set of things to be designed by a bunch of people in the Silicon Valley and San Francisco who don't have uh, a deep um, uh, engagement with, uh, with, with humanistic and social uh, issues and questions and, and, and values. Uh, you know, I, I, I think there's a real big place for the humanities there. Climate change. Uh, uh, um, Gene editing, CRISPR Cas9. There's nothing, nothing in our world that doesn't uh, immediately uh, uh, call to mind the importance of humanistic learning. But that is not to say that the humanity, humanities, as we define them and as we enshrine them in our curricula, uh, are exactly what uh, is needed at this at this moment uh, to deal with these kinds of issues. So, so I'm calling for a rethinking, as it were, of the disciplinary structuration of the university. Uh, and more broadly too, and uh, I'll just say this very quickly because I, I know our time is, is, is coming to an end, but I also think that universities need to think about how they're organized uh, in, in ways that could bring costs down. And you know, frequently when faculty here, administrators talk about uh, doing things that might involve some cutting, uh, they'll, they'll cry out austerity and austerity is a bad thing. Uh, and, you know, most recently we've seen these debates taking place at the University of West Virginia, which ha is having a, a budget crisis, uh, which is, uh, um, uh, you know, w 
which is contemplating cutting uh, major lines and, and departments and humanities, including in mathematics. And, uh, uh, and, 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 you know, it's, 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 it's clearly a situation that is, uh, that is deeply fraught. Uh, but, you know, again, this is like the canary in the coal mine. I had some of these same budget issues at Berkeley. In, in, in 2015, I was confronted with a $150 million structural deficit. And this came out of, you know, a long and complicated history. But it was something that was, um, uh, was, was a real existential threat for the university. And, uh, you know, we ultimately balanced the budget and it's balanced now, but it's, you know, it's a precarious kind of question going forward, how many universities without the huge endowments of Harvard and Yale and so on are going to survive. So I think, you know, rather than just crying foul and, and saying austerity is, 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 a, is a neoliberal uh, um, atrocity, uh, we have to we have to do two things. One is, you know, at the intellectual level, we can see perhaps what we mean by certain kinds of core humanistic components in the university. And secondly, begin to think about the resources that are needed to sustain the university as an institution, including paying the salaries of professors, uh, 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 in ways that would involve uh, finding more efficient, uh, more sustainable. Uh, and more affordable ways to uh, to fund some of what we do. And some of this involves collaboration across universities, uh, uh, creating new kinds of, uh, of, 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 of institutions themselves that uh, don't require every university to have everybody in-house, but to be able to perhaps share certain kinds of departments or certain kinds of resources in ways that are yeah, potentially going to change the way we think about the university, not just competing, but actually being part of a broader ecosystem. And so until and unless I think we take on board, you know, some of these kinds of um, structural questions, I, I don't think uh, we're in a position to simply say, you know, it's unfair that uh, that the humanities are being treated so badly today. Uh, Dr. Dirks, um... Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you on and a joy to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, PJ. I've enjoyed the conversation a lot.